Hey everyone, this is Ina, in with you in the fight back. Today I'm continuing something I started several months ago, and I laid out the program of Trotsky's left opposition, and what his proposals were for the development of the Soviet Union in the 20s. And I'd actually intended to follow it up with a look at the programs of the right opposition of Nikolai Bukharin, and uh, what Stalin had planned for Soviet development. And it kind of fell by the wayside, but I'm kind of bringing it back. And so this is going to be on Bukharin's right opposition. What did he want? What did he? How did he expect the country to develop? And you can see very much that Bukharin is going to have a much more conciliatory approach. Um, uh, very much kind of mutes a lot of class struggle themes, which is why he's put on the right in terms of uh, party debates at this point. Um, for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to in talk about whether Bukharin was a traitor, as uh, he was accused of being in his trial in 1938, or if he was a capitalist rotor. Uh, Mao Zedong certainly believed uh, Bukharin was a uh, capitalist rotor, and Trotsky believed that uh, Bukharin's program would ultimately lead the Soviet Union back to capitalism. For the purposes of this video, all of that is going to be laid on the wayside, and we're just going to look at what Bukharin proposed, what he wanted to do. Now, as we know, after the Civil War, Russia was pretty devastated, and the new economic policy was instituted, which allowed for a rather limited form of capitalist development, a very much controlled market economy, if you were. But it's, this is certainly not socialism. And various positions in the party were like, well, how do we get to socialism? How do, because NEP had largely developed the country back to its position pre-World War I. But this is, a com this is a socialist country. They want to develop socialism and communism, not controlled capitalism. So what did Bukharin want? Bukharin isn't alone in his um, advocacy on the right, there is um, Tomsky and Rykov, but Bukharin is very much the theoretician of the party, and very popular, and such. And Bukharin is very much a champion of the new economic policy, unlike Trotsky. He bases his theory on the idea that power is in the hands of the proletariat, by, because the pro, there is a proletariat party in command, and thus proletariat policies are shaping the country. Yet the proletariat, to survive, to hold on, needs an alliance with the peasantry. That is the foremost aim of government policy, it should be to strengthen in whatever way possible the alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry. And through this alliance, Russia can go forward to socialism and communism. Now to safeguard this alliance with the peasantry is also to ensure Soviet survival especially in light of international threats, which I'll get into later. Now, there are difficulties in the peasantry, because the peasants are small property owners in the majority, so they, they're kind of open to bourgeois influences. They have land, and they may want to have more land to become a boss, in a sense. They really don't have political experience in, in a large extent, and they have divided loyalties. So Bukharin sees them, they could go one way, they could go up the bourgeois road or the proletariat road, as it were. Now the peasant, for, but Bukharin is a, believes, along with the proletariat, the peasantry needs socialism, despite their often ignorance or lack of comprehension of what socialism is. So the proletariat, you know, wants socialism as well, but they're kind of not anxious to share power with the peasantry. Well, Bukharin's like, you, in some senses, you're going to have to share power or make concessions. And the new economic policy helps to solidify the worker-peasant alliance in the eyes of Bukharin. So socialism, Bukharin believes, can be achieved through the laws of the market economy, because the market ultimately is going to destroy itself anyway. Let's use it while it's here. So the agricultural development towards socialism is the peasantry would cooperate, or would operate with, with its pressure of self-interest, of course, to produce more grain for more profit, and with state, and also through state guidance, lead to an increase in farm size and to help make more their 
farms more profitable. So peasants' self-interest to expand their, uh, their farms to be more profitable, yet Bukharin also wants state guidance to do this. And in order to expand, Bukharin believes the path open for the peasants through state guidance should be that of cooperatives, which in the distant term would lead to collective farms. Um, so there needs to have a mechanism. So in order to encourage the formation of cooperatives and the expansion of the, of the peasantry and their um, grain yields and all of that, is you need a mechanism of collective purchasing, sales, and credit, you know, for agricultural equipment and whatnot. And this will help ultimately help the peasantry cultivate and develop. It, and at the same time, this would increase the role of the state to grant aid. And as conditions improve with the peasantry, the peasant would gradually become collectivized. They would almost be a growing into socialism. And this would draw the peasantry through their gradual development into collectivization into a closer uh, alliance or merging, if you were, with the state in industry. So on the other hand, this assumes, Bukharin believes, in order for the state to be able to do what it needs to to help the peasantry, industry needs to function efficiently. It, to, it needs to satisfy the needs of the villagers, of the peasantry. Industry, since it's socialist and by Bukharin's reasoning henceforth superior because industry is largely state-controlled at this point, he believes that industry will ultimately develop faster than other economic sectors. And Bukharin also believes that in helping the peasantry lead into cooperatives and ultimately collective farms, that their cooperation should ultimately be voluntary. And now, Bukharin is expecting the class struggle to continue, but he's largely expecting it to change character. And he believes that he believes that the proletariat needs class peace, and that's what the state and the proletariat is going to be proposing. And he's allowed the peasant. He believes that the proletariat and the party needs to allow for the peasantry, even the rich peasants, the kulaks, to take part in economic life. And the state could use the funds developed, again, from the rich peasants and even from the, uh, the new NEP bourgeoisie that is developing in the cities as well, to develop. Now, they use the market economy, the NEP, as it were, but it would, again, be strictly controlled. And the state would ultimately, because state industry is a more efficient because it's socialist, would be a more effective competitor with the bourgeoisie. And it would produce faster, better, and cheaper. And ultimately, as the state develops, they could pretty much eliminate or expropriate um, the rich peasantry or the, the NEP capitalists. And this, in Bukharin, is the socialism, by developing in this way, this gradual development, it's demonstrating its economic uh, superiority. It's demonstrating its potential. It's winning people over. Now, he sees the kulaks as an alien element, uh, granted, as both Trotsky and Stalin do. He sees them as very much uh, potentially capitalists, yet they should be allowed to form cooperatives, in his view. And he expects that their cooperative elements be determined within the framework that the state is allowing, so trying to push them into a socialist direction. He does say at one point that the peasantry should enrich themselves, and he's, speak, he's speaking largely to the kulaks, but he does want that the kulaks to be guided, like the rest of the peasantry, into socialism, since the state will be providing credits and grants and so on. And this approach would ensure slow progress towards socialism, admitted as such by Bukharin. And he wasn't over overtly worried about capitalist intervention to say in the sense that Stalin is or even Trotsky is. He even though Bukharin is one of the proponents of the theory of socialism in one country, he does and he does believe he ultimately believes that the Soviet Union will need some form of international revolution to help break the capitalist encirclement. Yet he believes that in the face of international intervention it's essential to keep the regime stable, to win the support of the peasantry, and that is, in a sense, the linchpin to Bukharin's strategy. Now, Bukharin, when collectivization developed under Stalin, he was opposed to the requisitions 
and he was also opposed to the way collectivization was carried out, and he was opposed to a lot of the way Stalin was carrying out the industrialization policy. And Bukharin was also opposed to Trotsky's formulations as well. Now, Bukharin was ultimately driven from high office under Stalin, and he kind of made a, a brief comeback, but ultimately um, it didn't work out too well for him, to say the least. Bukharin was later rehabilitated, as it were, under the Gorbachev era, and seen very much as a precursor to many of Gorbachev's policies. I think that's probably really not so much. Gorbachev was just pretty much looking for a prop. And there is, of course, Trotsky believed that Bukharin's policies would ultimately lead the Soviet Union to capitalism. And Stalin, when various grain crises were developing, he saw the need to undertake swift action. And Bukharin's approach, in probably no doubt in Stalin's mind, was something that was not so much um, viable at this point when sh tensions were sharpening in the Soviet Union. So I hope you found this informative on the policies of Nikolai Bukharin's right, right opposition, and I hope to follow it up fairly soon with um, what Stalin was proposing. So this is Ina in with you in the fight back.